Hey, I'm Dr. Morales. I'm a board certified cardiologist and electrophysiologist, and I've treated thousands of patients with atrial fibrillation. In this video, I'm going to talk about persistent atrial fibrillation as well as how to treat persistent atrial fibrillation. Persistent atrial fibrillation is for people who are in atrial fibrillation all the time. Uh, to differentiate that from paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, where episodes come and go and you're not in AFib all the time. So this video specifically is geared for people for, who are in persistent atrial fibrillation. If you don't have persistent atrial fibrillation, go ahead and, and, and check out the rest of my channel. I have a lot of videos on other topics of, of atrial fibrillation. But a lot of people ask me about what to do if they're in AFib all the time, what are their treatment options, so this is the video for persistent atrial fibrillation. So first let me talk about persistent atrial fibrillation in terms of what that means and how that means in terms of progressions and how that ultimately affects treatment options, okay? Persistent atrial fibrillation can be divided up into maybe short-term or long-term, okay? Short-term persistent atrial fibrillation means that you haven't had persistent atrial fibrillation, you haven't been in AFib for that long. Uh, I usually like to define that as probably less than one year, okay? Less than one year is when you're either diagnosed with AFib or knowingly have maybe less than one year of having AFib all the time. Now, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation is people who have had atrial fibrillation for over one year or longer. So if you had atrial fibrillation all the time for well over one year, you would have what's called long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. And the treatment options can be certainly a different between the two, and the success rate is ultimately different between the two as well. And so certainly I'm going to talk about both topics, uh, but I wanted to make sure you understand that the different Time, the, long, the amount of time you've had atrial fibrillation really influences the success rate of different treatment options, okay? Why does that matter? Well, the longer the people are in atrial fibrillation, if you have persistent AFib, the longer that is happening, the more your heart changes over time. Um, uh, there's a saying called AFib begets AFib. What that means is that AFib keeps causing more and more damage to your heart, which then makes it easier and easier for AFib to keep going and harder and harder to bring back normal rhythm. As time goes along, whether that's months or years, people uh, develop more scar tissue in the upper chamber of the heart. That upper chamber of the heart, which is where AFib comes from, that gets more what's called fibrosis or scar tissue. In addition, the upper chambers of the heart, which is where the atrial come from, become more stretched and dilated. I can look at people's ultrasounds of their heart and I can say, oh, they probably had AFib for a long time because of how stretched and dilated that upper chamber of the heart can become when AFib, people have been in AFib for a long time. And those factors certainly influences treatment options as well as what can certainly be helpful or work for people, okay? In general, when I have people with persistent atrial fibrillation, again, how long they've had their persistent atrial fibrillation really influences treatment options as well as what I suggest may work for them, okay? Let's talk about less than one year. Uh, less than one year persistent atrial fibrillation really has a good success rate. Um, and really, the options to get you out of AFib uh, are certainly work, uh, are certainly have a higher success rate than people who have had AFib for over one year. Uh, when people have been in AFib for a while now, uh, a couple options to get you out of AFib. Uh, always fair to do a cardioversion. A cardioversion is an electrical shock to the heart, uh, kind of like what you see in TV and the movies when they zap somebody's chest to bring them back to life. Same thing, but a lot less dramatic than what you see on, on TV or in the movies. Uh, so basically, I do always do mine with the anesthesiologist, make sure they're sleeping there and they're comfortable. When they're asleep, I try to shock their heart out of uh, atrial fibrillation to see if I can get them back into a normal rhythm. This can be effective for a lot of people. Again, you know, saying what's the success rate really factors in a lot with how long somebody has that atrial fibrillation. People have had atrial fibrillation for less than six months, pretty high success rate, you know, probably over 80, 90% chance that the cardiovascular shock will work. The longer they have atrial fibrillation, the lower that success rate becomes with a cardioversion shock, okay? So this, but I certainly can't help get people out of atrial fibrillation. Sometimes medications are needed to help keep the AFib from coming back again, but certainly a fair option. Another option would be a ablation procedure. Ablation procedure works better than any medication does, but it's also a more significant procedure, a more aggressive procedure than a cardioversion does. In an ablation procedure, um, Patients are, again, usually sleep with the anesthesiologist. Just with the needle puncture, get inside your groin, take catheters that go up to your heart. This part here, I usually like to get a heart model. AFib comes from your atria, or the top portions of your heart. In the back of that heart, there are these four veins that go from your lungs back to your heart, right where my fingers are right now. They're called the pulmonary veins. They have extensions of heart muscles and nerves in them, and this is where most people's AFib comes from. So in an ablation procedure, at minimum, I will ablate the areas around these four veins right here, 
and right here, that's where most AFib triggers, most of the short circuits that trigger AFib come from. Uh, and that's the same for the grand, grand majority of people. Uh, there's different ways this can be done. I usually use a burning energy these days, but there's also free, freezing energies. There's also newer type of energy options such as lasers, another thing called uh, PAFA, which is emerging as well. So there are a few different energy options, but ablating around those veins is pretty much routine. But sometimes people need to have ablations done more than that when you've been in AFib consistently, especially the longer you've been in AFib. There's several different strategies about what else to ablate, but nothing has really panned out to say like this is the one strategy you should do for everybody who has persistent AFib. Uh, I myself tell you to take the strategy of kind of customizing it based on what I see when I'm inside the patient. Uh, uh, um, a lot of times there's a lot of aggressive A signals in the entire back area of the heart and frequently I'll ablate that entire back uh, area of that heart. Uh, some of them might depend on where I see other scar areas inside the heart as well. Um, and, and it can be very variable from person to person depending on what I see when I'm inside the heart. I think a lot of other electrophysiologists uh, do that as well. But certainly again, uh, the success rate of all of this is better the less time that you have been in atrial fibrillation. The longer you've been in atrial fibrillation, the more ablation needs to be done usually, the more aggressive the procedure is, and ultimately the, the lower the success rate as, as well. Okay. So, But again, the sooner you get something done, the, the better the treatment options. What about long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation? What about people who have had it uh, for well over a year? Well, again, the treatment options for cardioversion versus ablation are still there. It's still a possibility. Um, you know, but the success rate ultimately goes down and down. The longer somebody has AFib, the more you get scar tissue inside your heart, the more um, you, that dilation happens in the heart, the lower success rate, whether that's cardioversion, whether that's ablation procedure, okay? People who have had a persistent AFib for over a year, I usually counsel them beforehand. You know, the success rate of this procedure is less than somebody in your setting, and you're more likely to need more than one procedure. There's not uncommon that people who have been had AFib consistently for over a year, that they need two or three ablations to get really good control of AFib, and it still may never be 100% cure, meaning 100% gone, uh, but it can, it may, frequently will need multiple ablation options to get really good success. It's just a, about the progression, you know, like anything in medicine, the sooner you address something, the easier it is to try to fix or improve. Uh, so the longer you've had AFib, the, the, high, the, the harder it is to get you out of AFib, and the higher like that you need more complicated ablations or even more than one ablation procedure. Another option for people who have more progressive AFib or have had it for a long time is actually surgical ablation procedures. These are more aggressive types of ablation procedures. Uh, there's a couple different types out there. There is a mini maze surgery, another one's called a convergent surgery, then there's an older traditional uh, maze surgery. These usually involve surgical incisions. For example, the mini maze usually involves sur several surgical incisions on, on both sides. Uh, people frequently will have some chest tubes after the procedure. They have to stay in the hospital for several days. And it certainly is a longer recovery time compared to a traditional catheter blaze procedure that I just described a minute ago. But it's a more aggressive option as well for people who are more advanced AFib. Maybe they didn't, the traditional procedure didn't work well for them. Then they, they, have, they want more aggressive options. The, those surgical ablation options can certainly be a possibility and it can actually work well for a lot of people. But again, it's, it's a more significant procedure was also with higher risk. The more significant the, the risk, uh, the more significant the procedure, the more significant the risks as, as well, okay? What about just staying in atrial fibrillation? Is that an option a, as well? And that, it certainly is a very fair option. There are many people who are in AFib all the time. You don't have to get out of atrial fibrillation. You know, there are many people who live in AFib and they do just fine living in AFib all the time. I've had patients who have been in AFib for 20 plus years or more and they're doing just fine, okay? But there's certain things that need to be monitored, okay? You have to make sure your heart rate is well controlled. You don't wanna make sure your heart rate's going too fast all the time because that could certainly increase risk for complications such as congestive heart failure. Um, you wanna make sure the overall function, strength of your heart is normal. I, I routinely do an echocardiogram at least once a year uh, on people who are in AFib all the time just to make sure the overall function of the heart is stable. In addition, it's very essential to have stroke risk reduction, okay? And that's, a, that's important for anybody no matter how long they've had AFib, but stroke risk reduction is very important whether that's with blood thinning medication or other procedures to reduce risk of stroke. Um, as long as those things are met, your rate is well controlled, you're being protected from risk of stroke, your heart function is normal, many people do well for a very long 
period of time. Um, the other, the last thing that I wanted to mention that can be an option for people who have persistent atrial fibrillation is a pacemaker. A pacemaker is a useful treatment option to help control the heart rate of atrial fibrillation. It's not a cure. Sometimes people ask me this question about, hey, will a pacemaker fix my AFib? It doesn't fix AFib. It help, can be a very useful thing to control the AFib, okay? And especially people who are in persistent atrial fibrillation. You're in, you're in it all the time. It can make the heart rate nice and regular, uh, require less medications. You're still in AFib, but the heart rate will not go fast anymore. It'll be nice and steady and regular. And there are many people who do better with the pacemaker um, with than they do with medication. So it certainly is, can be a good option for some people. But the caveat with that, to, to get the best optimal control, it includes a type of ablation called an AV node ablation. So in the heart, right in the middle of the heart, right around here, there's a central electrical connection between the top and the bottom portion of the heart called the AV node. So it transmits signals from the top of the heart to the bottom portion of the heart. So when somebody burns this central connection called an AV node ablation, you disrupt the electrical connection between the top and the bottom portion of the heart where there's no longer any electrical rhythm between the two chambers of the heart. That by itself actually makes the heart rate naturally usually very slow, right? probably around 30 beats per minute. Not compatible to just live around with a heart rate of 30 beats per minute. That's why this is almost, this is universally done together with a pacemaker. It can be done at the same time or different procedures where a patient gets a pacemaker put in and then either in that procedure or in a separate procedure they'll burn that center connection and then once that's done the actual heartbeat will be whatever the pacemaker is, is set at. Uh, so whether the pacemaker is set at 60, 70, 80, the heart rate will be nice and steady all the time, won't go too fast, won't go too slow and people frequently need less medication and that can be certainly be a very good option for a lot of patients. That is what I usually describe the patients as the end of the road. It can be helpful for a lot of patients when nothing else appears to work and there's really not any good options to get you out of atrial fibrillation. But when I tell my patient, when I suggest to patients a pacemaker with that AV node ablation, I usually feel that there's you've either had AFib for way too long, meaning many, many years, uh, and the options to get you out of AFib are pretty slim. And so this can be a very good method to control AFib with less medications. Now, Another question I get is, ultimately, can persistent atrial fibrillation be reversed? Meaning, can you just, on your own, get rid of atrial fibrillation? Possible, but unusual by itself. Let me see if I can explain this to you. Atrial fibrillation is caused by a lot of risk factors. It can, uh, primarily, risk factors include high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, sleep apnea, and a lot of these things can be improved with lifestyle modifications, particularly weight loss, uh, whether that's weight loss, also removing artificial ingredients, processed foods, added salt, added sugar. Living a healthier diet can lead to weight loss, improve your blood pressure, and improve your diabetes. And ultimately, it can also help your atrial fibrillation as well. So there certainly is a benefit in lifestyle modification, even for people who have persistent AFib. However, in my experience, there's been very few and far between where somebody actually does that and the AFib stops by itself. Um, very few, not impossible, but usually that can be helpful strategy together with your doctor. And let me see if I can explain it to you. If I have a patient that has AFib, persistent atrial fibrillation for two years, for example, and they really want to try to get out of atrial fibrillation, and I may counsel them and say, well, you've had it for a couple of years now, your upper chambers of your heart look pretty dilated, I don't know if it's going to work. I'm always willing to offer. I'm not, you know, to, to, but I have to counsel them. The success rate is not going to be as good. But if that same patient controls their risk factors, they lose weight, they improve their blood pressure, they improve their diabetes, at that stage, the success rate to get them out of AFib becomes better. The cardio version may work for them. An ablation procedure may work better for them. Maybe just one ablation works very well for them. So again, that's how the lifestyle modifications can be very helpful to improve and reverse AFib when you've had persistent AFib. It's a, com it's a strategy that you have to go together with your doctor. One of my favorite stories that I have is a patient I had a few years ago um, who had high blood pressure, diabetes, AFib for, for several years, uh, went on a health kick, ate very clean, um, lost over 50 pounds, virtually eliminated all his medications, but the AFib didn't stop by itself. And I looked at him and he really wanted to not be an AFib anymore. And I said, hey, wow, you've lost like 50 pounds. And he's like, yep, I've been eating clean for a long time. I'm committed to this. I've been doing great. I say, okay, well, you've earned a right to at least try to not be an AFib. So we did a cardio version. It worked great in one shot, despite the fact that he had been an AFib for many years now. 
and he stayed in normal rhythm afterwards, okay? And it was a, an incredible learning experience for me to say that it's never too late to try to get you out of atrial fibrillation, but you've got to kind of go back to the root of what caused atrial fibrillation. So again, reversing AFib when you've had a persistent AFib is certainly possible, but you need to do it together with your doctor to have a strategy to try to get you out of AFib because in my experience, persistent AFib is pretty rare to stop by, its own, by itself with lifestyle modifications, but those lifestyle modifications together with your doctor's plan to try to get you out of AFib, then they can combine together and they can do well. And even people can have AFib for many years, can have a good success rate to get you out of AFib. Because lifestyle modification is so important for anybody with atrial fibrillation, that's the reason why I created the Take Control of AFib program. The Take Control of AFib program is a step-by-step -step plan for everything that you would need to control AFib naturally, to lose weight, to remove things that can trigger or influence inflammation or AFib, and ultimately improve and reverse atrial fibrillation as well. So on the link, the link in this video, you'll see a link to my program where you learn more about the program itself. If you learn what's included, you'll be able to see testimonials of people who have actually taken the course. So check it out for yourself and see if that's the right thing, thing for you because it is possible to reverse AFib. Even if you've had a persistent AFib, just, you just need your doctor's buy-in as well to work with you. Otherwise, I wish you the best for your atrial fibrillation.